But anyway, uh, he has quite a background, and he's going to give us an update. He's going to give us a talk on how to become a commercial pilot, basically. To get to an ATP, Airline Transport Pilot, certificate and interview with a regional airline requires a multitude of steps and certifications. Uh, he's going to take us through that process. Caesar has an aviation management degree from Dowling College, worked for DM Airports, uh, operators of Morristown Airport, as an operations coordinator, and was the former school director of the American Flyers Flight School at Morristown Airport. He's a certified flight instructor and is currently working on his multi-engine rating at Caldwell Airport. He also has the board uh, interview coming up in January for an Air Force commission. With that, uh, Cesar, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Colonel Leach, for the introduction. Uh, it truly is an honor to, to be present before I am here, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for serving. Um, that's something that I look forward to doing. And so I, when, I, when I look at everyone here, it's, it's truly an inspiration to see um, everyone's uh, service and dedication to this country. Now, uh, I do have a presentation. I, I want to take everyone through what it takes to become a professional pilot. Uh, with the exception of Lieutenant Colonel Bob Boucher, does anyone uh, here have a pilot's license? Does anybody else here fly? Okay, this is Bill Fasina. Yeah, I'm a rated pilot. Instrument, uh, commercial license. Never flew for a living, though. Okay. As you get through the military, you a civilian. Um, I'm going to take everyone how to how to become a TP or how to become a professional airline pilot uh, through the civilian side. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So how to become a professional pilot this is your path to your ATP and professional pilot career. So the very first license that everyone will be exposed to when they, when they embark upon this kind of a journey will be private pilot license. So usually when you start your private pilot license, you're going to begin your training in this type of aircraft. Okay? Have you guys ever seen these kinds of sure. Notice that this on the left here, this is a Cessna 172, and this one on the right is a Piper Warrior. Uh, they are fixed wing single engine, land airplane. Okay, that's the kind of, you're, you're going to start your training on this kind of an airplane. So when you receive your private pilot license, you're going to get that license with two major restrictions in that license. Does everyone remember getting their permits or their, their provisional driver's license when they were learning how to drive a car? received your, your, your permit or your driver, even for me, uh, when I received my permit or driver's license, that came, uh, that came with certain restrictions. So similar concept with your private pilot license, you're going to have two major restrictions when you have your private pilot license. And the first restriction that you have is you cannot fly in the clouds as a private pilot. Okay, it's illegal. You need a special kind of training to be able to do so. So as a private pilot, uh, as a private pilot, you cannot fly in the clouds. And restriction number two is you cannot make a profit. Okay, so you cannot fly in the clouds and you cannot make a profit. Other than that, the sky's the limit. Okay, you can fly with your family, friends, uh, within the weight and balance capabilities of this aircraft. You can fly during the day, you can fly during the night. You just cannot fly in the clouds, and you cannot make a profit. So when you're continuing your training, knowing that you have these two restrictions, what do you suppose the next certificate might be? Well, that would be your instrument rating. Okay, Your instrument license is a special kind of license for you to be able to fly in the clouds. Okay, Can you guys imagine driving without seeing? 
be a bit tough to do so. So this is exactly what you'd see when you're flying in the clouds. It'd be completely white. And this type of training requires you to give a fly this aircraft precisely by sole reference to the instruments to be able to get to where you're going. Okay. This is actually my favorite. It's very challenging. Uh, and the best parts of this kind of flying is that here, when you're coming in for the approach, you break out of the clouds and you see the runway right in front of you. That's one of the most uh, adrenaline rushing experiences that anybody can have. <laughs> okay. But you still have one major restriction with your, even with your instrument rating. And that is, you cannot make a profit. You still can't get paid to fly. So we're on our way. We're on our way. So after our instrument rating, we would go for the commercial pilot license. Now, with the commercial pilot license, finally, we can start getting paid. Great, but, and there's a huge but to this, there's only some things that we can do to get paid. There's only a handful of things that we can actually do to get paid as a commercial pilot. So let's talk about the things that we can do as a commercial pilot. We're nowhere near the airline. Okay. But we can start getting paid. So, for one, you get your CFI or your CFW license. Now, these are the percent licenses. CFI allows you to pet, uh, um, teach private and commercial students. The CFWI license allows you to teach instrument students. I encourage uh, most students to, to get both when they're going for their CFI licenses in order to make them more competitive, in order to have them teach everyone. Okay. Uh, but teaching can be pretty hard. So I ask them to do a lot of self-reflecting. If teaching is not for you, there are other options that you can do. Okay, uh, you can do banner towing. I'm pretty sure that you've been to the beach. You've seen some some of the banner towers out there. You can get paid to do that and build your hours that way. Uh, you can do parachute operations. Has anyone ever jumped out of a an airplane? No. No. Not no. yet. Not yet. Good, good. I like to hear that. Not yet. I Not as highly... long as I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, most Is that people. A perfectly good airplane. Most people will say they won't jump out of a perfectly good airplane, but uh, you know, I, I I said the same thing until I did, and I had a blast. <laughs> it was phenomenal. So, um, if you do have the opportunity to do so, please take it. It's 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 a really 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 cool experience. Uh, you can also give tours. And uh, landmark surveying. I actually have a couple of buddies who are doing this. They're out there in Mexico. So there's a company that um, put in some some new radar equipment to 182s and 182s called LAR. And uh, my buddies are out flying in the Yucatan Peninsula, scanning the forest uh, for Mayan ruins, monastic ruins. So this is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool experience. Landmark surveying. Okay. Now, now you can get paid to fly. The objective to become an, uh, an airline transport pilot is to reach 1,500 hours. I'm not sure if you guys heard of that requirement, but to be a professional airline pilot, you have to have a minimum uh, of 1,500 hours to qualify. So these are the ways that you can do it and pay it at the same time. Now, the most popular way... Like I, uh, like I might have mentioned before, is to become a flight instructor. Airlines actually prefer flight instructors, and the reason for that is because you're you're teaching the craft, mastering, you're mastering the craft. Uh, either way, whichever way you get there, uh, you will get there. So after you, uh, you, you've done your commercial, you're reaching up to your 1500, you want to learn how to fly a bigger plane, faster, heavier. You're for your multi-airplane, 
Now, the, the current rating that I'm going for now, I call it the But it would And what I encourage most people to do is to get what's called the multi engine instructor license, MIA. Uh, the more licenses you have under your belt, the more competitive that makes you for the airline. So I encourage people to get their MEI right after their commercial multi add on, which is something that I'm, I'm doing right after I get the multi add on. So this right here, this is a Piper Seneca. Really. So after your multi, and you're building up to about 1,400 hours, maybe you have your 1,500 hours, which is great, then we can start talking about your airline transport pilot. For your airline transport pilot license, you need the required 1,500 hours of full time. And now I included this link here. Everybody can see it. Uh, this link, I can give it out to anybody who, who would like to see it after the presentation um, and show them. This just has the, the uh, requirements of the 1,500 hours in more detail of exactly what you would need. So within... Uh, those 1,500 hours, you need a certain amount of hours of a certain thing, for example, of night flying, of cross-country flying, of instrument flying, and so on. Okay? Now, when I was director at American Flyers, um, I got this question a lot. Uh, do you need a degree to be eligible for the airline? And the answer to that is, that depends. Uh, depends on the airline that you're going to go for. Um, I know for certain that Delta, if you, if you wanted to, to work for Delta Airlines, they do require a degree. Uh, airlines like JetBlue or, or Spirit don't. So that just depends on the airline that you're going to go for. Now, I do encourage um, students, when, when they're thinking about this kind of a career, if they can fit in getting a degree, do it. Please do it. If I was an employer and I was looking at two resumes equal in, in aviation experience, one of the candidates had a degree and the other candidate didn't, I'm going to go for the candidate that has a degree. Okay, So if you can get the degree, do it. It's going to make you more competitive. Now, regional airlines versus hey, sir, I, I have a question. Uh, yes. When you say a degree, do you mean uh, in aer an aeronautical degree, an engineering degree, or uh, just a good old BA? It can be in anything, believe it or not. You can have a degree in music. <laughs> okay. Um, now, obviously, the point, obviously, if you have a degree in a technical aviation of technical a degree or you have an aviation management degree or, or aviation business or um, anything aeronautical or aviation related, yes, that's going to be a, a major advantage for sure. But definitely, if you can, get a degree. That makes you more competitive. Okay, good question. Thank you. Now, there there is a difference between what the regional airlines are and what corporate aviation is. Now, both are... are uh, both require an ATP for you to be able to operate um, in their operations. So, for example, um, if you look at if you look at the top here, I put in some of the some of the aircraft that you're going to be exposed to in corporate aviation. So, here on the on the upper left, you have a Goldstream 650, and on the right, you have a Falcon 7X. Uh, really, the main difference between what, what corporate aviation does and what uh, uh, airlines do uh, mostly resides in your schedule. So you, your schedule is going to be quite different. You are, uh, as a corporate pi aviation pilot, you're going to be uh, in demand uh, or your time is going to be more demanded than if you were to, to go through the airline. So it really, really comes down to what kind of a lifestyle you're going to want. 
um, when considering choosing either the airlines or corporate aviation. But both are very rewarding. Both are very high paying. Um, it just really comes down to the lifestyle that you're going to want. Okay. That's your ATP license. So let's talk about the type of training that you're going to go through to become uh, while you're becoming a pilot and you're going through your certifications. Okay. So you're going to be exposed to ground theory and uh, the practical. You're going to fly and use the simulators. <laughs> now, if I were to ask anyone here, uh, which of the two between ground theory and, and, and the practical, the flying, is more important, what would you say? Both. Both are important, I agree. Both are very important. But one is actually a little more important than the other. Ground theory is a little more important than the practical. Okay. So you have to hit the books while you're becoming a pilot. And the reason why ground theory is a little more important than the flying is because you have to know the right information to be able to make the right decisions when you're up there. Okay, when you're driving, when you're driving a car, what are you doing most of the time? You're looking out the window, good, I would hope so, <laughs> right? Um, good, you're positioning yourself between that, good. So all of that, you're looking out the window, you're positioning yourself, all of that, you're making decisions, all right? The majority, the, the, what you're doing most of the time you're driving is you're making decisions. What speed limit should I be at? All right, rules and regulations. All right, well, when can I merge? What exit do I have to take? You don't have to actively think about driving the vehicle. You don't have to actively think about pressing on the accelerator. All of that becomes muscle memory. You know, the more you do it, you've been, you're, you've been driving enough to a point where it becomes muscle memory. You don't have to think about it. But you still have to know the right decisions to make. So the same philosophy applies to flying. You need to know the information to make the right decision when you're out there. So. There are three exams you have to take to get a certificate. Um, do you, do, the, the gentleman that, that told me that he had uh, his private was instrument rating, do you remember what exams they were? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so long and well, you got to take an instrument written. Uh, you got to take a written, good, good. You got to take a written, fantastic. What else did yeah, you do? You got to take a commercial written. Um, a commercial written. And um, I don't know. I forget the other. Of course, a private, but written. Yep. So you, the first exam you take um, when you're when you're oh you're going. saying not oh what other types so so you got to yeah. take in flight you know you got to do your your in flight uh, for yeah, a new flight in flight yeah. for a uh, instrument and in flight for a commercial you perfect you take, right yep so yeah so you have to take a written um, I'm not sure if you remember but you have to take an oral you have to do an oral and oh and then, right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Before you, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, a, and then you're that practical. Sure. You got. It. So you have to, in order to get a certificate, whether it's the private license, your instrument, commercial, your CFI, all the way up to your ATP, with the exception of the multi, you have to take a written, an oral, and a practical to get your certificate. You have to pass all three. Now, if you guys take so, a look at the. the so let me let me just throw something at you here for my group. Um, I took my first uh, private license test on Okinawa, 1971. So yeah, I kind of forgot some of it, <laughs> the oral and all that. <laughs> but anyway, we had to fly from one island to another island. That was the practical. You had to fly uh, because that you couldn't. On the island, you, there wasn't enough distance to uh, do the practical, so we flew to uh, another island. Yep, that's awesome. It's what what, been what a few were, years? What What did you fly? What did you do your? Well, that was a one seventy two. Oh, the was a one seventy two. That's fantastic. You know, with steam gauges, with steam right. gauges. <laughs> that's the way to do it. If, if If you ask me, if you ask my 
Well, that's the way you should learn with Steam gauges first. And then you can transition all to all the fancy stuff that, you know, that there is out there, like the G1000s, but you, you need a really good foundation to, to understand what's happening. So I, I agree that with the Steam gauges, that's the way to do it. Um, but yeah, so three exams you have to take, a written, an oral, and a practical to be able to get your certificate, okay? Now, in order to take an exam, you need an endorsement from your flight instructor to be able to take an exam. Uh, so what is an endorsement? Can anyone tell me? It's a sign-off that you have completed uh, the ground school and the um, air work that's sufficient. At least, well, for the written, I guess it's just the um, the knowledge part. Right, right. So uh, you need an endorsement to take the written, and you need an endorsement to take the oral and the practical. Now, an endorsement, just the word itself, an endorsement is an authorization for you to do something. So in this case, uh, a certified flight instructor will be authorizing you to take the need that endorsement. So let's take a look at what an endorsement says, what the literature of an endorsement is, so that you guys can understand why why the aviation industry, why the training or the education of the aviation industry is what it is. Okay, so that is that is an endorsement. That is my endorsement given to me when I took my commercial pilot practical test. Okay? And it says that I certify that Caesar Salazar has received the required training of 61-127 and 61-129. Does anybody have any idea what those numbers mean? 61-127 and 61-129. Okay. So those are actually, the those are regulations exactly the regulations and uh, and you'll find the regulations uh, in this book the FAR Federal Aviation Regulation book here every industry in the United States has their own code of federal regulations the aviation industry has this the Federal Aviation Regulations book so if you guys were to pull up the this specific number sixty one one twenty seven and one twenty nine it has everything under the commercial pilot sun that I'm going to be evaluated on when I do my test. Okay? So, I've received the required training of 61-127 and 129. I have determined that he is prepared for the commercial pilot practical test. The instructor that gave it to me, Douglas Carrington Renfield Miller, okay, uh, his CFI number, and the date it was given to me. All right, almost a year ago. <laughs> in order for, for me to get Douglas to put this in my logbook and sign it, what do you think I had to do? I had to show him that I was ready for the test. So we were on the ground, and he asked me everything about the commercial pilot course, and I was, and he expected me to answer with confidence and accuracy. And then we went out to fly. He had me flying that airplane to commercial standards. Until finally, we get back on the ground, and he says, Caesar, I think you're ready. Slaps this in my logbook, signs it, and the next thing that happens is we call the FAA, they send out an examiner, an FAA-designated pilot examiner. And the first thing that examiner does is he takes a look at this endorsement. And he takes a look at my logbook. And he goes, okay, Douglas thinks you're ready. Perfect. Let's do it. Let me go and take the test. If I pass, everyone wins. It's a great day, obviously. <laughs> if I fail, it's not a ding on me. But the examiner, he's going to turn around and he's going to look at Douglas and he's going to say, hey, man, what happened? You told me he was ready. And it's actually a demerit on that on that certified flight instructor's license. Okay? So these flight instructors uh, want to absolutely make sure that you are ready to take your test before they give you this endorsement. 
And if you think about it, it's a brilliant system that the FAA has in place because it ensures the instructor teaches you correctly. It just doesn't, doesn't just hand them out, right? Does anybody have questions on that? Is that right off the bat that uh, this happens with the instructor? Or after another try, um, and if you failed again, then it's a mark on him. But so, I think they say something about they don't consider that you fail the test anymore. It's, it's that you miss those items, and then you have to come back. Yeah, so you, so, right, to answer your question, what, once you get your, your, the, for, as a, as a flight instructor, once you get your first failure, that is marked on your, on your flight instructor license. So, it, each, each flight instructor, or every airman for that matter, has a, a profile in the FAA database. And when you're flight instructing and you're giving out endorsements, you get a pass fail percentage rate. And once you dip below a certain number on your pass-fail uh, percentage rate, so if you have a, a, a pass rate of, if you dip below 70%, the FAA is going to have an eye on you. And you you, you don't really want that. <laughs> um, as well as your, your employers. Your employers do look at that and they consider that when you're, when you're uh, ready to join the airlines or when you're ready to jump into the corporate um, flight departments. Um, when, when, as a student, when you do, if you do um, fail uh, a check ride or the oral or the practical, um, it's it's still considered a failure. You do get a letter of disapproval, but what they do is they don't. You don't have to do the full check ride over again. What you do is the, the examiner takes in everything that you successfully did. And you only have to do what you missed. Mm. Right. Uh, when, when you're going up for the check right again. Okay. So that's the, that's the types of training that you're going to be exposed to. So I'm just going to show you guys specifications, time and cost estimate because we want to know, okay, uh, what, how, how long and how much money is this going to cost? And we know right off the bat then uh, that anything in aviation is pretty expensive. So with the caveat, if you train three days per week and you study about an hour and a half to two hours per day, for your private pilot certificate, you can expect to get it done in three to four months, and it'll be anywhere between seventeen to twenty thousand dollars. Okay. So that's just for your private pilot certificate. Now, the reason why there's a range, three to four months, 17 to 20, okay, is exactly what we talked about prior. I mean, everyone learns differently. Everybody learns at their own pace. Okay, So these are averages taken uh, by coming into train three days per week and you're studying at least an hour and a half to two hours per day. For your instrument license, you're looking at two to three months, and anywhere between twelve to fourteen thousand. For your commercial, six to nine months, thirty to fifty thousand. If you're looking to do your certified flight instructor and certified flight instructor instrument, you're looking at two to three months, seven to ten thousand. Your multi-engine can take two to four weeks, nine to sixteen thousand. And your ATP takes about two to three months, and it's anywhere between 10 to 30K. Once you get to your ATP, to your 1,500 um, hours, and you apply to a regional airline, you get accepted. What they do is they, they uh, you go through indoctr in indoctrination. Uh, and that usually takes about two to three months, and you're, you're going to be given a class date. And what, and they actually pay for your ATP license initially or upfront. That's when you take, take the ground school classes and then you step into the simulator and get your ATP usually with a type certificate. 
after they pay for it initially, and once you you're on the front lines as a first officer, they start docking that pay from your paychecks until you have paid them back. Okay, that's your ATP. So the total time and cost of training, not including the ATP, can take anywhere between 14 to 22 months if you're looking to do the private instrument commercial multi-engine CFI and CFI. All right. And it'll be anywhere between 75 to 120,000. I usually tell uh, most people it's like going to college. So it's a, it's, it's a tough endeavor <laughs> for most people that don't have the opportunity uh, to, to do it. Um, so 14 to 22 months, 75 to 120,000 to be able to go through private instrument commercial, certified flight instructor, multi-engine. Okay. Some special considerations. So to start training, you need documents to be able to start your flight training. You need to be a U.S. citizen here in the United States. You need a U.S. passport. And you have to get a medical done. Now, this is a special medical. You have to go to an aviation medical examiner. Uh, if you're looking to do it professionally, I encourage you to get your first class medical right off the bat just to ensure that you can get one. Because you're going to need a first class med medical to be able to become a professional pilot. You're going to have to create a training regimen for yourself. If you want to be successful, just like going to the gym, if you want to be successful, you have to create a routine to do it. So you need a study regimen. I usually uh, encourage people to do three days out of the week. I understand most people, when they're looking to do something like this, they have um, other things in, in their plate. They have, you know, other other jobs, their family, other projects. Uh, so that when they're doing something like this, try and create a training regimen for it. It's going to set you up for success. Finances. So we already spoke about the total cost uh, of of this endeavor. If you can have the funds available, if possible. Or uh, if you're if you're doing it you're doing it step by step. Have the funds available for the certificate that you're training for, and the reason for that is because you don't want any interruptions in your training. You don't want to start your private pilot training, run out of funds, take a huge break, and then when you get back into it, you're almost going to have to start over. So you don't want to do that, you, you don't want that to have to happen to you. So I, I highly recommend if you can get the funds, if you can get a loan, do that. It's going to help you. Uh, and supplies. So to get started, everybody, can everybody still see my screen? Well, thank you. Uh, to get started, this is what uh, what I usually encourage people to, to get. So you can... you. What we did at American Flyers, we had a private pilot kit, and uh, usually the, the things that you want to have readily available is um, a flight bag. Oops. Okay. You want a flight bag, you want your headset, flashlight to be able to fly at night, a plotter, your logbook. You're going to need charts, you're going to need you're gonna need some books, the oral exam guide, the FAR AIM, an E6D flight computer. And, uh, and other airport charts for information to get started. You guys can see this is a pretty expensive endeavor, but the opportunities are out there to, to, to get this done. Okay. Does anybody what have are your thoughts if any of the group is not interested in or not, you know, they already had a career and they just decided, well, now I have some time for myself and I think I can pass the medical. Um, what do you recommend for anyone who'd like to take it up as a hobby? Right, to take it up as a hobby. For for whatever for whatever certification you're going to be going for, there there are two main things that I, I highly uh, I can't encourage enough. When you're going for a license, you want to set up a training schedule for yourself. So take a look at your your schedule for the week and see what time. Can, how much time you can dedicate to this thing? Because the more the more time that you can dedicate to it, the faster and the cheaper your your license is going to be, as opposed to 
uh, when you can only dedicate, for example, maybe one day a week to your training, uh, you're working with the instructor one day out of the week. When you come back next week, you're going to probably have to repeat some of the stuff that you did last week. So you don't you don't really want that. What you want to do is come up with a good training regimen for it. And uh, and if you have the finances available for that per particular certificate, even better. It's a really good question, Susan. What if you just join? join if I can, um, if I can jump in here for a second, um, I don't know. Most of us are fairly senior, but I would. I'm surprised Howard hasn't jumped in with this. You know, if if you have kids or grandkids or even adults, and you want to fly, you know, the Civil Air Patrol has programs, particularly for young people, where they can. Uh, get their private license or at least solo through the Civil Air Patrol. You can fly Civil Air Patrol planes after you have your private license at no cost. Um, and the instructors are volunteers, so you don't pay them. So, you know, all I'm saying is that that's an option to look at to keep the price down of this training. And uh, once you get certified, once you become a private license, a uh, private pilot, you can then get mission qualified and fly missions for the Civil Air Patrol and build up a lot of hours. It's an alternative. It's not the only alternative, but it is an alternative uh, to look at or consider to keep those costs down. At some point, you're going to spend some money, but... You, you could probably cut those costs in half, um, which is still a lot of money, Caesar. So I, I just share that because uh, I did a lot of Civil Air Patrol flying myself, uh, and uh, I could have flown every day of the week. Um, sometimes my bosses would wonder where I was because <laughs> I'd be out flying for the Civil Air Patrol. But just right, an option to keep open. That's phenomenal. Huh? I've where are I, the planes now in North in the New Jersey? The, the the squadrons that have have aircraft. So I haven't kept current, uh, Susan. Uh, but they used to be. They used to be one at Morristown. They used to be one at Somerset, and uh, they used to be one at Trenton. And those are one seventy twos. They used to have a high performance, uh, which. Um, which was based in Trenton. Uh, you, you could get a high performance retractable rating. Uh, and they had a multi engine down at McGuire. I don't believe they have the multi engine anymore at McGuire. But those other three or four I mentioned are uh, at those locations. Let me help you out with the locations. So there is, there is one in Caldwell. Uh, you can also fly out of central Jersey in addition to Trenton. And the way it works, if uh, if there's enough uh, interest and use of the planes, well, it's not impossible that someday we get a plane back to Morristown. Right. When I was uh, the wing director of operations uh, back in 99, 2000, I had, I won't say a personal plane, but we did have a plane at Somerset. That was, you know, I have priority on that plane. Um, and we had a plane at Morristown at that time. And uh, because the, we were doing a lot of flying. I did a lot of flying. Um, you know, uh, counter drug flying, uh, training with the Air Force, um, and uh, search and rescue. Uh, you know, uh, so... If there if there are enough pilots, enough interest, if when you get called you're going to go on a mission, you know, then they will make sure there's planes near you. You know, it is interesting in New Jersey if you go on a search and rescue mission, there's really not too often a search and rescue mission where you do not know where the plane has gone down. Uh, but if you look at the JFK crash. Uh, we, Jersey was the first, uh, wing launched. We launched at 8, 8.30 in the morning. I believe it was a Saturday morning. 
to search, you know, the route. We did route searches of his uh, his flight that day. And uh, uh, so, you know, it, you can do some fairly interesting things. And uh, and they will put the planes in place. Uh, if, you, if you're flying them, they'll put... Each plane, I think, has to have... Uh, I want to say they look for 60 hours... Uh, is it a month uh, or a year? I, I don't remember the number. Maybe you can help me out with that. It's I, th- I believe it's about a hundred dollars a year that they're shooting uh, for. Okay. And uh, at the uh, at the present time, we're not quite getting there. The oh, medical would be a good uh, topic of discussion at some point. Yeah. That that seems to be right. a big issue. <laughs> so maybe I'll come to a Lone Eagle meeting one of these days. I was squadron commander of Lone Eagle, Eagle for a while. A long time. Oh, you should, you should come back. When we start meeting again, I'll let you know. Right. Or Howard will let you know. Sure, I'll let you know. Sure. Great. Guys. No, are, that's okay. You, 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 you raised really good points. And, and to your point, it is a very expensive endeavor. Um, the, I have just come to learn about, about uh, the Civil Air Patrol and, the, and their mission and what they do. And I, I think... This is a great opportunity to link uh, and and uh, be able to grow with the Civil Air Patrol to to help a lot of uh, a lot of aspiring candidates and students who don't have money or don't have the opportunity to pay for their flight training um, and and use that as a vehicle to promote aviation and promote the cause and the mission for the Civil Air Patrol and and, and the Air Force. Um, and so this, this is. Uh, so there, you know, and 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 if you're a cadet, if you're a young person, uh, and you want to be a cadet, and then you decide to go into the Air Force, it, so you you're in the Civil Air Patrol, you complete, you know, this test you have to take to progress within ranks, um, and then um, you decide you want to go into the Air Force as an enlisted person. Um, you go to basic as an airman basic, but instead of coming out of uh, basic as an airman uh, for a uh, third class, I guess it is today, uh, it will be an E2. You come out as an E3. So, uh, you know, and we've had a number of cadets uh, out of Lone Eagle back in the day that did that, you know, and so they're making a little more money and, uh, you know, what have you. Of course, you know, those, uh, as, as some cadet, uh, some cadets or some airmen call it today, they're, they're on the four year college program. And the four year college program basically says, hey, I'm going to be in the Air Force four years. I'm going to get the GI Bill and I'm going to college. Go in the Air Force and get out and collect the best GI Bill since World War II. Um, they get a lot of money. They get a lot of money. Okay, I'm off my soap opera for the Civil Air for soapbox for Civil Air Patrol. Or, uh, well, thank you, Caesar. Are there any other questions uh, for Caesar? Okay, thank you very much for a very uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation on how to become a commercial pilot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,